Michelle Brown, our programs manager here at the Bro. Um, just welcoming you to the fourth of uh, the Soul of the Nation Gallery talks that we've been holding here at the museum, in which we've invited a lot of people with a multiplicity of perspectives, gallerists from the time, the 60s and the 80s, young artists, community organizers, um, just a plethora of voices, and we're really excited tonight to welcome Savannah Wood, who's to my right. <laughs> Um, can I start her bio real quick and then we'll get started? Savannah Wood is an artist with deep roots in Los Angeles, Pasadena, and Baltimore. Since returning to LA in 2015 after three formative years in Chicago, she's been doing curatorial and communications work at Clock Shop, a multidisciplinary arts organization based in Bogtown. Savannah is interested in uncovering obscured histories, tapping into ancestral magic, and disrupting linear readings of time. She makes photographs, clothing, and plant-based art sculpture. Okay. And with that, um, Savannah's gonna lead us uh, to the Art on the Street Gallery, and then we'll be in there and just talk and have a good time. Thank you. Right. Yeah. She's gonna roll on. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming, first and foremost, and thank you to Janelle. Um, as she said, my name is Savannah Wood. I'm an artist, I'm an organizer, um, but I also come from a family of newspaper makers. So my great-great-grandfather um, founded the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper in 1892, and it's still running to this day. My aunt runs it. Um, so I have a very close and familiar relationship with the black press. And so today I want to talk about the Black Panther Party's newspaper, um, and its revolutionary influence in the world. Um, and before we kind of get into that, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the way that the black press functions. Um, white press has always said in some way that they're objective, and we know that that's not true. But the black press has never have said that. We've always been fighting for something or against something, and it's been very obvious in the way that the paper comes about. Um, so when you think about, for instance, like, the Great Migration, the black press was a major driver for that. They were the ones who were saying, come west, come north, there's opportunity here. We're, we're broadcasting that. And so from city to city, from state to state, there was a solidarity between peoples and um, a connection that was being made. Um, so when Janelle asked me to do this talk, I was like, I definitely want to talk about the Black Panther Party newspapers. This is an amazing collection that they have here. And this is unique to this showing. So it wasn't in New York and it wasn't in London. So we're really um, lucky to have this in Los Angeles. So when we're in this, this room and we're in this show, um, the show is about art in the age of black power. When I think about black power, I think about representation and self-determination and this paper is an example of that as well. Um, when, you th when you think about the Black Panther Party, do any of you guys know where it was founded? Harlem. You say Harlem, you say the Bay? Los Angeles, Oakland, the Bay, okay. Um, so the Black Panther Party as we know it was founded in Oakland, but they borrowed their name and their imagery, well, the Black Panther itself, from a political party that was in Lowndes County, Alabama. So in this county, it was 80% black. It's situated between Selma and Montgomery. And um, they were trying to get representation in government. So this is in 1965. This is around the time of the Voting Rights Act. And SNCC, which is the um, Student Nonviolent Coalition, um, they were under um, Stokely Carmichael at the time. And he was trying to gain some political traction there for the black population. And so their party, the political party, was called the Black Panther Party. Um, they lost that election, but it was the, the Panthers in Oakland were so inspired by it that they took on the name and took on the image. Um, and so the Black Panther image, it was meant to um, relate to the way that it felt to be black in America at that time, which is when you're backed into a corner, you have no, uh, no other choice but to fight, basically. So when you look at these papers that are on the wall, you can see that the Black Panther that's up here is like ready to crawl, ready to fight. And that's just how people were feeling at that time. Um, when, so Emory Douglas was the one who made all of the artwork for these newspapers. And he was the appointed revolutionary artist and minister of culture for the Black Panther Party. And even in that titling, you can understand that the Black Panthers had a sense about language. They were saying that we're a self-determined governance and we're here for revolutionary purposes. 
Um, and when you think of the Black Panthers, what are some of the imagery that comes to mind? Like when you think about them. So the fists up in the air. Anybody else? Pigs. Pigs. Mm -hmm. All the women who were the backbone. The women of the yeah. People. Yes, absolutely. Um, something that comes to mind for me in particular is black clothing, black berets, black sunglasses. There was a strong visual um, force that they brought. And they wanted to have this uniform so that they could be identified. They also, many of them carried guns with them throughout the street, exercising their Second Amendment rights. And so this was provocative. And the, the reason why they were being so provocative, they wanted to be seen so that they could be heard, so that be, they'd be taken seriously so people would be paying attention to it. So just in the same way that they represented themselves physically in public, they were representing themselves through these papers. So I want you guys to kind of like come in and take a look at some of the imagery that's on here, because it is really provocative. And the images that you see represented, Ellie, I heard you say pig. One of the ones that's up here um, on the far left, the Panthers were creating language, um, and they were making it popularize. And so in that image, you see um, a pig who's meant to be a policeman. And they're dressing him up. He's got flies all around him. They also include a definition of what a pig is, which is a lowly creature who is terrorizing the black community. And so what, when you see that image, and now you're in your community and you see police officers, that image is now in your head of like, oh, this isn't just a person who's a, uh, a person of authority. This is somebody who's out to get me. So they're using this style as a form of propaganda in a way. Um, and then you see throughout some of the other images that are here that the pig comes back. It's a motif that's continued as part of um, the Black Panther's iconography and part of what they're using as their language that they've created. Um, so for instance, in this piece, there's a woman who's standing on a table and she has posters that the Black Panther Party has created in the background. And you can see here also that they're selling these posters that were designed by Emory Douglas. So they had a really smart savvy about them. They were thinking about the way that images travel. You can, uh, you can imagine that when they found the Panther image in Lowndes County, Alabama, that had to travel to them. So they knew that images would move around and that they would inspire people. So when you see this, it's like they're selling those posters. So those posters show up again in this image here. This woman has a rent bill on her table. And she's saying, I spend so much time fighting the rats in my apartment and the roaches that I can barely take care of my own family. And then it says something very provocative on here that says, um, when I spend more time fighting the rats than taking care of my children, you know, it makes me realize that I have a right to kill the greedy slumlords who force me to live in these inhuman conditions. So that's an extreme statement, most people would say, right? So what, what the planters are doing here, though, is that they're provoking you so that you have to think about the conditions in which you're living, and you recognize that you're not alone in this, you know, and that there is a way to organize around it. Maybe you don't go so far as to actually kill your landlords, <laughs> but maybe you find your neighbors and you say, you know what, we can organize around this, we can at least push back. And so these are essentially advertisements that the Panthers are running, saying, let's collectively organize, let's get together on this, we have, we have work to do. Something that I find to be really fascinating about them is that they also understood how oppression worked across the board. They weren't only concerned with black citizens, and particularly being founded in Oakland, where it's a very racially diverse place, they made space in their newspaper for other groups to, um, to celebrate their causes, to get their voices out. So for instance, they were supportive of Cesar Chavez, and they gave room in their paper for that. That's not represented here, but it is represented in the archives of the Black Panthers. And then in this piece, which is one of my favorites, it's showing this pig again, this time representing US imperialism. And it says, get out. Get out of the ghetto. Get out of Africa. Get out of Asia. Get out of Latin America. And it's all of these hands squeezing the pig so that it doesn't have any power anymore. So if we were to work together in this way, then we could subvert the power. And because they were thinking internationally, they were also inspiring other groups who were functioning on an international scale. So there are people in other countries all over the world who took the model of the Black Panthers and used it for their own purposes, um, trying to get their power collective, collectivized. And so you think about the way that they used their uniforms. Other groups were yeah, putting on uniforms, basically. They were creating papers that could go out and be distributed um, and using those tactics. And we know that the Black Panther Party was so successful because the United States government worked so hard to shut them down. So the Black Panther Party was formed in 1966, and J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI at the time, 
who said, I want the Black Panther Party to be gone by 1969. And so that's when a lot of activity was happening in those years trying to shut the Panther Party down. They were infiltrating the Panther Party, trying to cause disruption and distrust within the ranks. They harassed people and they murdered people. And so that's what happened to disband the party. Um, and if you look around in this gallery, actually, behind you, we'll, we're seeing the face part of it, but on the other side, there's a fist, which we talked about already, which was the, the fist that we, rep we think about with the Black Panthers as Black Power. Um, so they were, influ they were um, influencing culture, influencing artists. And all the way over there, that green door, it says U.S. approved on it, and it's meant to be a representation of the door where Fred Hampton was murdered in his sleep by the Chicago police. If you look, um, oh, where did it go? There's a piece over here also. Oh, this one here. This is a representation of Bobby Seale's trial in Chicago, where the court actually had him bound and gagged in the courthouse because he was protesting not being able to have access to representation of his choice and not being able to represent himself. So this is on the Black Panthers newspaper. And then it also shows up two galleries over in a piece by David Hammonds because he was so charged up about what had happened. And these images were spreading all over the place. They knew what they were doing here. There's a long history of political imagery that uses really stark images with really succinct text to tell a story of oppression. Um, and, and I didn't mention this earlier, but Emory Douglas had a background in design and advertising. So he, he came to this with this knowledge of how to use images to really galvanize an audience and get organization happening. And when you look at these, you see they're 11 by 17, so they're tabloid size. So you could pass these out to people really easily. People would wheat paste them around town. At the height of its production, there were 400,000 copies in circulation every week. And you can imagine that those probably pass between the hands of more than one person. So you can say, you know, maybe if you gave it to one other person in your household, that's 800,000 people reading this paper and becoming politicized by what's in there. Um, so it's a really powerful tool for connecting people, for getting the word out, for having people understand the nature of their oppression and how it's related to other people throughout the world. That they're not alone, that in fact we are a majority and that's something to be, there's something to be said for that. I wonder if any of you guys, um, if, if there's anything in here that sticks out to you as something that you want to talk about a little bit more. That one, that image really struck me. The one on the top? The one where all those different hands. Yeah, I think this one is really important. Like it, it unites, like I think that's really important, yes. Yeah. So you were saying the one where all of the hands are um, holding onto the pig. That really, to me, like I said, was showing this, um, this collective power, that if we were all to work together in this way, that it would subvert that power. Um, also, you can just see throughout here, there's a lot of um, condemnation of the war in Vietnam. So it was a very active political period throughout the, the, throughout the country, and they were covering all of that. Did they uh, ever cover the, the things that they were doing to help the community with the food bank? And stuff? They did. Is that in the papers? Or is that is in the papers. That is in the papers. And oftentimes, so the Black Panther Party had a 10-point platform of things that they thought were most important, and those were often illustrated in the paper also. So the one that I spoke about earlier with the woman who's standing on um, this table saying, you know, I, my rent should not be this high, this is ridiculous. But one of the tenets was, we want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. And that's written underneath this. So they're always incorporating their ideas back into, into the paper also. And so it's in an easy digestible format also, where you could see this on a corner. You could see it in your friend's house. Um, you could see it on college campuses all around the country. That's a great question. I think, um, I think the term pig had been used before the Black Panther Party came about, but they really popularized it. And a big part of that is because it became like a pop symbol, you know? Yeah, so it's used throughout, and it kind of gets these different iterations. Um, for instance, in this one, it's the US imperialist, but they also use rats to, to um, represent that as well, which is more about like American greed. Uh, but they were using these images of animals to um, evoke the power structure that was oppressing them. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Oh, it's not really a question, but yeah. um, a lot of the graphics, and I think like the one with the red background, yeah. look quite similar to 
graphics that were being used by in Vietnam and mm -hmm. in China in that period. Mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I think there was a lot of um, communication and crossover between artists and just people throughout the world who who were coming together either at conventions, um, which were happening at that era of people from all over the world coming together to, uh, to talk about the oppression that they were experiencing and an exchange of these different forms of, um, of media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can talk about from your knowledge of like the other newspapers yeah. that were operating at the time maybe and were different ideologically. Other black mm -hmm. newspapers like just kind of how this existed relative to them. And Absolutely. Is there any um, forms and standards of reporting that the newspaper may be revolutionized? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the black press has existed in this country since about 1826. That was the first black newspaper. And at the time, that was just a revolutionary act. There were not very many people who could even read. So you have to take that into consideration is that the paper became this tool for people to learn literacy. Um, and for people to represent themselves. And it had a really strong force. There was like a golden era of black newspapers. And actually, in some, some people consider um, the civil rights era to be a time in which the popularity of black newspapers actually started to dwindle because of the successes of the civil rights movement, that more black content was being put into white papers so that you didn't necessarily need a paper that was full of black content when you could read about other things and get your little like snippet about black news in there as well. Um, so this paper comes at a time that's kind of towards, edging towards the end of that time, and its content is so much more incendiary than what you would find in any other paper. And so they knew what they were doing. They were coming out as a revolutionary paper intent on making major change, and really just not satisfied with what had happened so far. Um, so they were really pushing hard against that. And, and the graphics in these papers are so much more based in, in art and in design than you would see in other newspapers um, at the time or even before then. So it's just taking a, a different approach. And really, um, the newspaper existed and was an idea before Emory Douglas came on to the paper. Um, but Emory Douglas is the one who really like solidified its structure and made it what it is today and made it as popular as it became. It was published in, uh, in Oakland? Yes, in Oakland. And how, did it, how was it distributed? On street corners primarily, initially. So, so did it make it to New York? Oh yeah, it did, because at a certain point there were chapters set up across the country, and so people were, would send the paper out to all of these different locations. And then if people were traveling, they would take the paper with them and have it go across overseas. People would send in orders. But initially it was just Black Panthers on a street corner, literally on every street corner in Oakland. Handing them out or selling them? Selling them, them. But, for, but for a, just a like, minuscule amount of money, you know, but selling them. There was an allegation at one point mm -hmm. that the FBI and Quantico Pro actually infiltrated these papers mm -hmm. and putting in illustrations and drawings to draw a wedge in between mm. Panthers and the other black parties at the time. Mm -hmm. Do you, can you speak on that at all? Not in depth, but I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it because it was such an insidious program um, and they were really targeting the black press in general. So it doesn't surprise me that there would be an intersection between the Black Panther Party's newspaper and the black press. Um, and several other black organizations that were um, functioning throughout the country. So I, I didn't look into that specifically, but it doesn't surprise me that that might be the case. Yeah, there's a documentary called The Bastards of the Party. Yeah, okay. They talk about that. Thank you. They, how they used the papers. That yeah, they yeah, makes sense. Makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was really a, across the board. And you can see that the, the imagery was so popular at the time that it makes it onto the cover of Sonia Sanchez's book of poetry. People wanted to use this imagery to connect themselves to the party as well and to, and to make sure that people understood that these ideas are what's going to be found in this, in this pamphlet. This is what you're going to be talking about, reading about. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like this now? That's a great question. What was the question? Is there anything like this now? Well, something that I was thinking about actually when I first started kind of thinking about what this is exactly, is this, this combination of strong image and, and succinct text. I often think about memes in some way. I mean, it's very, it's different, but it's, but it's the same, you know? And like, when you think about propaganda and you think about the way that the Russians influenced the election, they used memes and they specifically targeted black people using memes to dissuade us from voting. And so it's using this same format of image and text to drive a point home and to and to change minds 
and to change action. Yeah. Well, I might be. <laughs> Anybody's willing to, you could take it. If you want to write it, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all in there. I have no idea like what time is like and if we could keep talking forever or. You're at 720, so you have 10 minutes. Okay, great. I have, I want to talk about all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> if you guys have any more questions. The Black Panther paper in print. That's a really good question. I think it was, I think its highest circulation was in 71 and 72. So it definitely went. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was how long was the paper in print? Um, and I don't know the definitive end date, but I do know that it started in, um, in 67 and its high point was in like 71, 72. And so I would imagine it had a couple more years after that before it went out, but I don't know when it stopped being printed. Yeah. Why did it stop? Because the Panther Party disbanded primarily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's the word. <laughs> that's yeah. the word. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, come on, let's go. I mean, I'd much rather have it be a discussion, too, so <laughs> I said my piece. I'm wondering, so, you know, Emory Douglas exists as a minister of culture, and now I think, you know, the way he exists in the cultural landscape is as an artist, mm -hmm. kind of historicizing his work, but, like, what he's yeah. making now as an artist. I wonder if you just have any thoughts on him, not as an artist or his art per se, yeah. but just how his imagery circulates independent mm. of newspaper and mm. the times in which the newspaper was produced. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of historicization that happens with his work. Um, and part of it is because it's, I find it to be so graphically strong in this era um, and the way that he's using line and color. And some of it is like an economy of means, like they only could afford one color. And so it's like black, white, and one other color. And I think that's just a really strong graphic representation. Um, but the way that his work is moving now, it's, I think that he'll always be tied to the Black Panther Party, like no matter what. I don't, I don't think he can ever really move away from that, no matter what kind of work he's making. Right now he is making work that's more about um, our current political situation, but even he's making reference to his old prints in talking about the current events, because there's so much similarity. You know, the Black Panther Party was founded as the Black Panther Party for self-defense, primarily in opposition to uh, police brutality, which is something that we're still dealing with, we're still talking about. And so I think that his images will always be tied to the Panther Party in some way. And I think that that's powerful. So that's what I, that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, what happened to Huey? To Huey? Yeah. Um, Huey Newton. Yeah, he died, yeah, he died in a drug, in a drug tussle. No, he was he was on heroin. Yeah, I mean he was in Cuba for a while and then came back. Oh, and he was in training. So they, oh yeah. They succeed. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, so do you do you think that the newspaper succeeded in their mission of like disseminating the? Education? Yeah, I absolutely do. I absolutely do because you know in certain instances I think in the, and particularly with this image that I was talking about of the woman on the table who's fighting um, for for a better situation, better living. When you're in that kind of situation, you have so much on your plate. There's so much pressure, so you, can't, you don't even really think about the possibility of being able to fight back also. But what this paper did was to tell people that you're not alone in this struggle. You have other community. You guys can all band together and fight against it. And so I do think that it got people out of their houses, into the streets, into the Panther Party, and talking to each other, organizing, and coming together to really push for change. Was the newspaper centrally uh, located in, like, in a small place or throughout the country? It was throughout the country. It was founded in Oakland and then throughout the country and in the entire world, actually. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So it traveled. And we think about the internet as being the only way that information can travel, but like the black press in particular, as I was saying in the very beginning, like luring people out of the south into northern cities and sh telling them this is where you can work that will be safe, this is where you can land that will be good. It's like it's been around, it's been communicating ideas for a very long time. Yeah. Basic yeah. Um, I I used to move here from Mexico, so a lot of mm -hmm. this is very new. I mean, I knew how I know how real yeah. The struggle was back then, you know? Mm -hmm. But how was maybe like Martin Luther King, it was it directly linked to Black Panther? How was Not directly linked, but there's so much crossover. Um, so Martin Luther King had ties to SNCC. SNCC was um, the organization that was in Lowndes County where the, Black Panther, the political Black Panther Party was founded. 
Um, so there's all of this crossover, all this ideological crossover, but Martin Luther King's platform was primarily um, nonviolence, and the Black Panther Party was nonviolent and less provoked. And so there's slight differences in ideology in the way that they represented themselves, but the general aim was for black liberation across the board. And so it wasn't a direct link necessarily, but there were so many, there were so many people in community and in conversation and communication at that time. So there's always crossover. And then, I mean, and then, like I was saying earlier with that piece and with a few other ones, is that even between people, not black people, it's like, yeah, I mean, we all, we all were talking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? This isn't so much a question. That's great. It's just a statement. <laughs> yeah. I found the whole exhibit to be obviously very thought-provoking and, and poignant, but for me, this section was the most poignant mm -hmm. because not only is the graphic style, you know, very close to artistic styles now, yeah. the representation of, of modern uh, artistic representation, but a lot of the things and a lot of the subjects that are still being ta are tackled back then right. are still the exact subjects that are being tackled right. now. And I look at this revolutionary student poster, right. and the first thing I thought about was school shootings right. and about hmm. you know not necessarily children of color, but all children, you know. Um, that's fighting interesting. Fighting to just have access to education and safe environments. Yeah. And of course, police brutality and even the housing crisis mm -hmm. that California in, 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 um, in particular has been experiencing for over a decade. Yeah. Then you also think about the fact that the Black Panther Party started in Oakland. And I think we could all agree that, you know, the sort of apex of the housing crisis is happening in the Bay right now, mm -hmm. where a lot of these brown communities are being. Um, right. Pushed out. Right. So I love the whole thing, but this particular uh, section really felt like it could have been made yesterday. Mm -hmm. I know. So I know. And that's the really damning part about it. It's because yeah. you ima can you can you imagine what would have happened had the Black Panther Party continued? Right. Had it not been broken up? You know, you think about the way that the U.S. government actually adopted some of the some of the programs that the Black Panther Party came up with, like. Right. Like free free lunch, lunch in school right. is from the Black Panther Party, you know? It's like, so for them, it was really a huge threat because they saw how the Black Panthers were uniting people and taking care of people in the way that the U.S. government never could, would, or wanted to. And they knew that they were essentially driving a divide between Black Americans who were self-determining and the U.S. government who still wanted to maintain control. Sorry, why, when, how, or why was it terminated? Um, well, we talked about it a little bit, but the, um, the FBI had a program called the Counterintelligence Program, um, and basically it was breaking up black organizations, primarily black organizations throughout the country, um, and infiltrating them. So they had double agents, or agents just come in and pose as Black Panthers, cause disruption within the party and distrust, and so there were factions that split off. So where there was solidarity and trust before, it was broken up and, and it just created chaos within it. So there was that, and then there were also just flat out murders of people who were leaders within the party to cause fear so that people wouldn't show up. So this, there's a piece of text over here also that's like about an anti-fear campaign, which is basically like, yes, we know that the government is doing this, trying to scare you, but you need to step up and you need to keep representing because that's just proof that this is working. That they're actually scared of what we could do if we were to actually be organized. And then also the heroin came into the community. Yes, then there's that. So there's all this heartbreak in the party, you know, and yeah. the heroin comes in. And that's yeah. how Pee Wee and everybody, yeah. a lot of people got hooked on the heroin. Yeah. So, which is also a parallel to today, right? Right. Because Absolutely. We're in crisis, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, see what you can do for each other. Part of the reason why the Black Panther Party is so amazing is because people were pitching in a little bit here and there. You know, the free, the free breakfast program was because black businesses donated a little bit of money from their businesses to feed the kids. You know, it's like people just were stepping up to take care of their community. That was the role of collective folks in Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. we see that throughout the exhibition. Yeah. Um, and if we have contemporary examples of that, or mm -hmm. how well, I think the Black, um, Black Lives Matter movement is thinking about the Black Panthers a lot um, in the programming that they're doing and the way that they're spreading out across the country and have different chapters throughout the country. So there's communication between cities and there's um, actions that are um, collectivized and that are uh, moving together. 
Um, and then I think throughout the rest of the show where there are other collectives that are working together, it's really just like feeding off of these different ideas. So when you have more than one person in a room, the ideas that are generated are just broader. You can, you can do more with them. Um, so I just think it's more, you know, power in, power in collectivity. Does that answer your question or not really? No, I think so. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, if, if we're doing that today, if we're doing that today as artists. Mm. You know, and, Got you. Um, yeah, the role of capitalism and telling us that we're individuals and yeah. not part of the life. Yeah, yeah. Do you, are you an artist? Okay. Sarah is the curator okay. of the exhibition. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, hold on. <laughs> I was like, we haven't met yet. <laughs> yeah, I want to yeah. think about that. Yeah. That in our contemporary moment. Absolutely. And I do think that there are people who are creating spaces within Los Angeles and elsewhere for that in particular. I mean, I think about Black Radical Imagination as a program also that's traveling throughout the country and that's bringing um, independent filmmakers, experimental filmmakers together. Um, to really think about new possibilities for both cinema and for black people. And I think that that's a really generative space where they show up in different places. So it doesn't have to be a solid location in any one place, but they can really mobilize different people across the country through showing up in that way and through inviting people in. And that's sort of different too, because it's not necessarily like a fixed collective, but it's an, an evolving one. It's sort of more of an amoeba, which I think can be really strong too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? The mic's on. <laughs> yeah. You're good at projecting. I was projecting. I was using my theater voice. <laughs> Daughters. It's Asada's daughters. Oh, it's just called Asada's daughters. Yeah. yeah. They're all about um, like Afrofuturism and reimagining mm. like, a new world in Chicago. Mm. Oh, we have Arsa one. Yes. Sorry, I had to catch. I was thinking the same thing. Well, let's give Savannah a round of applause. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Thank you for coming.